morning, whether you're here in church or elsewhere in the World Wide Web, uh, we welcome you equally. Um, glad to see that you all came at the right time this morning. Now that we are firmly uh, embedded in Greenwich Mean Time. Um, start as usual with a song. Um, been reminded recently of the essentials, the sort of um, the base roots of our faith, and that going back to the Reformation, that um, salvation comes through Christ alone, um, through faith alone, uh, through Scripture alone. And the first um, song is uh, "The Lord is my salvation." Just a reminder of that. At the uh, beginning of our worship, we come together to remember the things we've done wrong and to seek forgiveness. And as usual, the words will be on the screen. Now, it's probably better if we're standing to read those words. So if you'd like to stand, please. So we say together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left those done those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us sinners. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a disciplined, righteous and godly life to the glory of your name. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Um, Andy has a, um, to, now to perform a very short but necessary act. Thank you. What an introduction. Um, for those of you were um, able to join us for our annual parochial church meeting on uh, Wednesday, uh, or for, for those who, who weren't rather, then uh, we had a, a great encouraging time reflecting on what God has done through this past year and on into 2019 and giving thanks to God for that. Uh, and then looking forward to, um, to what he has in store for us. And part of that was electing new members of the PCC and we were really thrilled to welcome three new members of the PCC. Uh, which is Pat Briffer, uh, Caroline Waring and Mark Smith and uh, we also uh, re-elected Russ Waring to be our church warden. Uh, normally, uh, side of coronavirus times, then there would be uh, a big formal service with the Archdeacon where Russ would be formally admitted into that role uh, but because of the current restrictions, that responsibility has been given to me as uh, the local vicar, which I'm delighted to be able to do. So can I invite Russ to come and stand before us now? Uh, and this is an opportunity uh, to hear what a church warden uh, does for Russ to be able to express his, his willingness to do that and for us to express our support to him in that role. So church wardens are called to represent the people of God, to work with the leadership of the parish ordained and lay, to be an example and encouragement to their fellow Christians and to promote unity and peace. As you come to be admitted, I ask you to affirm your commitment to this calling and to seek God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit to fulfil it. And so I ask, will you as church warden, seek to work with the bishop, the parish priest, the parochial church council, and all those who exercise leadership in your parish 
to further the mission of God and his purposes in the world. I will, the Lord be my helper. Will you undertake your task as a spiritual calling and seek through the power of the Holy Spirit to promote true religion, unity and peace? I will, the Lord be my helper. Will you care for the fabric and property of the church as stewards under God and make it your responsibility to ensure its proper upkeep and repair. I will, the Lord be my helper. God give you grace to serve him with dedication, cheerfulness and humility. And may his all-powerful spirit direct your paths throughout the coming year through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before Russ makes his declaration, let's have a few moments of silent prayer as we commit Russ and his uh, role to the Lord. So Russ, if you'd like to make your declaration. I do solemnly and sincerely declare that I will faithfully and diligently perform the duties of the office of church warden to the best of my skill and understanding. Well, we really do sincerely thank you for being prepared to take up uh, this office. And it's my privilege to admit you to be church warden in this parish in the name of Christ. Amen. Part of the role of the church warden, which I'm about to read out from canon law, is uh, that Russ, along with the leadership of the team, is to encourage all members of the parish, all members of the congregation, in our mission and our ministry. And this is a reminder of that. He says, The church wardens, when admitted, are officers of the ordinary, which is the bishop. They shall discharge such duties as are by law and custom assigned to them. They shall be first foremost in representing the laity and cooperating with the incumbent. They shall use their best endeavours by example and precept to encourage the parishioners in the practice of true religion and to promote unity and peace among them. They shall also maintain order and decency in the church and churchyard, especially during the time of divine service. And so as a show of support, and in commitment to the Lord, we're now going to join together in our diocesan vision prayer to express that commitment to all of us playing our part in the mission of the Lord. So let's pray together now. Heavenly Father, we embrace your call for us to make disciples, to be witnesses and to grow leaders. Give us the eyes to see your vision ears to hear the prompting of your spirit and courage to follow in the footsteps of your son our lord and savior jesus christ amen amen Russ, thank you so much for taking on this role Andy uh, continues our series in uh, the opening books of Genesis. We're going to have our reading. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, with the tree of life and to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden 
cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In, in 1969, uh, Peggy Lee recorded a song called, Is That All There Is? And throughout the different verses, she sort of recounts different experiences of her life. Uh, so for example, one verse talks about at 12 years old, she says, my father took me to a circus, the greatest show on earth. And she talks about the wonderful things she saw at the circus. But then the verse ends with her saying this, I had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what, but when it was over, I said to myself, is that all there is to a circus? Another verse, she talks about falling in love. Uh, head over heels in love with the most wonderful boy in the world, she says. And she talks about this whirlwind romance, but then at the end of the verse, she says, then one day he went away and I thought I'd die, but I didn't. And when I didn't, I said to myself, is that all there is to love? And interspersed between these different verses is the refrain, the chorus, which goes like this. She says, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. Now, I think that song by Peggy Lee taps into a, a feeling that is common to most of us, I think, that we feel from time to time that something is missing, that there's more to be gained or to be experienced, and we're just missing it. C.S. Lewis articulates this really well when he says this. He says, most people, if they really, uh, had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want, and want acutely, something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promises. He goes on to say that it, whatever it is, has evaded us. And then finally he goes on to say, if I find my, in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that is something of the answer that I think we see here in Genesis 2 and 3, to that feeling that we all experience of wanting more but never quite getting it, of that, that it, whatever it is, evading us. Genesis 2 and 3 says that's because you were made for more than this. You were made for more than this. And it all comes down to understanding this curious uh, detail in the, the story, which is the tree of life. The tree of life. Have a look at verses 8 to 9, if you've got a Bible with you. It says, God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do you get the, the picture there? So let, let's just recap on what we've learned so far from about Genesis 1 and 2. Remember, the Garden of Eden is being presented here as a temple as the place where God dwells, where he is worshipped, where he has relationship with humanity. It's the mountain of God, where God dwells. And then we're told, in the middle of this garden, so on the very top of the mountain, the holy of holies in the temple, the very place where God is, right in the middle, there are these two trees. The tree of life and the tree of knowing good and bad, or good and evil. 
Now next week we're going to think about the tree of knowing good and bad and what that is all about. But today we're going to focus on that other tree, the tree of life. And the first thing I want us to notice about this tree of life right in the centre of the garden is that humanity was designed, was made to eat from this tree of life. In fact, verse 16, the first humans were commanded to eat from this tree of life. Have a look at verse 16. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Or literally, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, Eat, eat, or certainly eat, from any tree in the garden. But don't eat from that tree of knowing good and evil. When you eat of it, you will die, die. You will certainly die. So eat, eat, from these trees. Don't eat from that one, because you'll die, die. And the assumption is then, that the tree of life was included in this command to eat, eat. Eat from all of these trees, including this tree of life. Well, what would it mean for humans to eat, eat from this tree of life? Well, we're told in chapter 3, verse 22, after humans have lost the opportunity of eating from this tree, have been banished from the garden, what does God say? Verse 22, he says... Uh, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and bad. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Eating from the tree of life is to live forever, eternal life. Now I want to make two really important points here from what we learn here. The first thing is this. We're presented here with eternal life, living forever, being a gift that God offers to us. God says, eat, eat. And if we were to eat, we would receive eternal life. You see, often we, th we think of humans as being created sort of naturally immortal. Or having eternal life and then that's something we lost. But actually this says, no, no, no. It was always to be received as a gift. It's not something that comes naturally to us. It's not a natural part of us. It is something that only comes from God. Because God is the source of life. He says, eat, eat, and you will have eternal life. It's a gift of His grace. Because as I said, life comes from God. And that brings me on to the second really important thing, just to note about this tree, which is this. It's not a magical tree. Sometimes we sort of have this picture, don't we, of this tree of knowledge of, uh, of, of life as this magical tree, where if you take it and you take a bite, all of a sudden, blah, 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 you know, I've become immortal. I can now live forever. I don't think that's what's being portrayed here. It's not a magical tree. Remember the context. This is being described as a temple. And where is this tree? This tree is right in the middle of that temple, in the Holy of Holies, the very place of God's glory and presence. So this tree of life is a symbol. It's a sacrament, if you like. A visible sign and seal of a greater reality. Be, to be near the tree of life, to eat from the tree of life, to feed and be sustained by the tree of life, is to be near to God. To feed from God, to be sustained by God as He gives to us eternal life. It's to, to feed on God's very own life and presence. What does that mean? What does that look like? It means that we were made to, in a sense, participate in God's own life, in God's own glory. We were made in His image. We were made to participate in His rest, His royal rule. We were made to eat, eat from God. It's as though God in the tree of life says, Take, eat, this is my life offered to you. The 
tree of life tells us that we were made for more than this. We were made for fellowship with God, for union with God, for communion with God, to be sustained and feed from God. And that's helpful because it shows us that this life, this eternal life that's being offered, is not just a perpetual existence. It's not just an endless life. It is life in abundance. Life to the full. Life as we could not even imagine it. It's being transformed and glorified to become more and more the image of God. Because of course just a perpetual endless cycle of days it doesn't necessarily need to be a good thing that could be a bad thing in fact it seems to imply that once sin enters the world and humanity starts living a life in rebellion against God and living according to a wisdom that it decides rather than God decides that's why God casts us out of the garden he said well I can't for them to endlessly live in rebellion against me well that would be an existence worse than death and so humanity is excluded from the garden. A flaming sword is put between us and the tree of life. Now, you might be saying, well, that's not a particularly happy ending. Uh, is this sermon a just a sort of unlucky lads? Here's the speedboat you could have won. Enjoy your cuddly toy. Well, no, because actually, this is just the first few pages of the Bible. And if we read on in the Bible, we see that the rest of it tells this story of, of the way that God deals with that problem. It tells us how God makes a way for us to return from that exile, to be brought again, to feed from the tree of life, to experience the joy of God's life and presence. And that story, that way, climaxes with the Lord Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not die, die, but should have what? Eternal life. And this is how John, the, the Gospel of John, presents Jesus. Jesus is that tree of life, what that tree of life symbolizes. He is God with us. God in the flesh, he is the one who comes to feed us with his life. John tells us that Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Jesus stands up and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die die. Jesus even presents himself as food. John chapter 6. He says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. He says, I'm going to give you that food that gives life. In fact, he goes on to say, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus is life. Jesus is food. Jesus even describes himself as a tree. John 15, he says, I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. The incredible reality is that Jesus brings that tree of life reality to us. And he says to us, eat, eat. Have it. Don't die, die. Eat, eat. The great good news of the gospel is that all who put their trust in Jesus become united to him, become joined to him, become close to him and share in his life. We become transformed into his likeness. 
And one day we're told when he comes back, whether we've died before then or whether we're still alive, we will be raised to a glorious resurrection life where we will share in his glory in the new heavens and new earth, where we will have that eternal life that we were made for. Barbara pointed us to this passage a few weeks ago, Revelation chapter 22. This is what we will experience that day. It says, The angel showed me a river of water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of a great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, for they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever. That's what you were made for. You were made for more than this. You were made for that. You were made to eat, eat from that. That is what Jesus offers us. And he calls us again today to put our trust in him and to receive what we were made for. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you made us for life. You made us for life in its fullness, life in abundance, life sharing in your very presence. And we thank you that even though in our sin and rebellion we've turned away from that and experienced death, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus you love us so much that you offer us that life again. You call us to feed on Christ and to receive eternal life. And I pray for every single person here listening now that you would give us the faith to trust in Jesus and to respond to his invitation to eat, eat, to have life to the full. Amen. Before our uh, prayers, we're going to uh, declare our common held uh, beliefs in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which again will be on the screen. So if you'd like to stand. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the ever everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. I am starting with a verse that Andy encouraged us with on Wednesday night at the APCM. It's from Proverbs ch chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. You, Lord, are a gracious, loving God, and you have revealed your faithfulness and generous provision to our church here. Thank you for the money we have received, 
both from the grants and from the generous donations from the people of St John's. These have enabled us to continue with the plans we have to reach out in your name to the families in this area and also to support those who are reaching out with the gospel to the wider world. We thank and praise you, Heavenly Father, and we ask that you will continue to guide us and use us for your glory's sake. Amen. Lord God, as the coronavirus epidemic continues, we pray for people who live and work in care and nursing homes. Please be with them and their families through these trying times. We also ask that you will grant wisdom to those in the NHS who are deciding which treatments and operations to cancel in order to make room for coronavirus patients. We give thanks for all who work in homes, hospitals and hospices and pray that they will have the strength, energy and love that they will need in the coming months. Keep them safe, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. And now a Barnabas Fund prayer. O oh Lord, as we wait in a world of turmoil for an end to sickness and anxiety, face masks and lockdown, loneliness and job losses, Enable us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to be strong and take heart as we wait for you to deliver us. Give us grace to look beyond ourselves and remember others in far more difficult situations, especially our brothers and sisters in contexts of persecution or great poverty where coronavirus has been yet one more hardship to add to what they already bear so patiently. Bless them and provide for them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for our government. O oh Lord, we long to see your Holy Spirit move among them and stir their hearts and minds so that they would trust in you with all their hearts, acknowledging you and discovering the paths that you would guide them to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for any members of our church, our neighbours, our friends or family who are ill, May they rest in your healing arms and be blessed with peace. Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we conclude our prayers this morning uh, by the words of the Collect for the last Sunday after Trinity for Bible Sunday. Blessed Lord, who caused all scriptures to be written for our learning, help us so to hear them, to read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your holy word, we embrace and forever hold fast the hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. 
Amen. And we come to our uh, final song this morning. Um, before we go on our way, it looks like a, a load of words uh, jumbled up. Uh, I'm sure it will make sense when we hear it. Who you say I am. Let us pray. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. And the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.